uh, we've learned all of, you know, sort of the basics of supersymmetric theories. We've learned about soft breaking and a little bit about how supersymmetry might actually be related to things we describe in nature. Uh, and we were, had started last time to talk about supersymmetry breaking so, and, the, and the sort of microscopic theory of supersymmetry breaking. Uh, and so I say we've accomplished a lot and we don't have that much to do in the remaining six hours that the organizers have given me today. Uh, actually, we will have to go a little bit quickly, but in the beginning I want to talk about some of this dynamics in a little bit of detail. And then I'll revert eventually to slides to sort of conclude sort of where we are uh, in, in, in our understanding. And I hope set up a little bit, for, uh, for example, some of the issues that will arise in Maria's talks uh, towards, the, towards the end of the school. So we started talking about this very simple model of uh, supersymmetry breaking the so-called Rafferty model. I can't spell. I'll just call it OR after now, uh, after this. Okay, and we had, so this model, we just had uh, three fields. We had a superpotential, which was x, uh, a squared minus mu squared, and a mass term plus m, y, a. Okay, this was a model which has a continuous R symmetry. We mentioned this theorem of Nelson and Seiberg, which says that for Susie breaking in a generic way, you need a continuous R symmetry. And here we have R sub A equals, uh, R sub X equals R sub Y equals two, and R sub A equals zero. Okay, and in that way, every term in the superpotential has charge two. Okay, and we saw indeed that supersymmetry was broken. DW, DX, for example, was not equal zero. Okay, for, I see, I should put a coupling constant here. And so for lambda mu squared less than m squared, uh, dw dx was not equal to zero, dw dy was equal to zero, uh, a and y were equal to zero. Okay, a and y were equal to zero, and x was undetermined. So there was nothing in the equations for the potential that determine this x. And I want to talk for a few minutes about what determines x. Okay, so what I want to describe is the so-called Coleman-Weinberg calculation. Okay, so what we have here is a situation where classically we have a, a modulus. Okay, classically, you know, as in uh, Nikita's lectures, we have a modulus. Quantum mechanically, though, because supersymmetry is broken, there's nothing that protects the potential of that modulus. And, <coughs> pardon me, and so uh, there will in general be some V of X. And the way we can calculate that is we can just think about looking at a vacuum with a non-zero X. And in a vacuum with non-zero X, X, the various fields, these A and X and Y, have masses which depend on X, the fermions and the bosons. Okay. And so we can calculate the energy just as we sort of would in our first course in quantum field theory. We can write that the energy E, which depends on X, so this is like V of X, and this is like very much, in fact, like the Bohr and Oppenheimer calculations that Eric has talked about. So we have some E of X, which is a sum over all species so let me say helicity states the sum minus one to the f, I'll remind you what that is in a minute. There's a d3k over two pi cubed. And we're just summing over the zero point energy, so we have a half square root of k squared plus m i squared of x. Okay. Okay, so that's the so that would be the vacuum energy. Okay. And we can ask how this looks in our theory, okay? And so let's think about how this looks. And in particular, let's ask about how this looks for large k. How this integral behaves for large k. Okay. So for large k, okay, the leading term is just some sum minus one to the f. I should say the minus one to the f you can understand easily. I should have explained that. Though with, with the, for bosons, you get a plus sign. That's the zero frequency part. For, my, for, for fermions, you get a minus sign. That's the, you can think of as the filling of the Dirac C. Of course, more formally, you can derive this straight from a path integral or however you like. Okay. So we have some minus one to the F, and the leading term is then just integral D3K 
over 2 pi cubed, and we have a half k. Okay. And that's very divergent. This is the usual quartic divergence in the vacuum energy. Okay, we're encountering what David talked about in his first remarks. Okay, uh, that you know normally we have this very severe divergence, and we might imagine this is cut off maybe at the Planck scale or somewhere else. Okay, so we have this very severe divergence, but because the theory is supersymmetric, because we have the same number of bosons and fermions, these terms can be taken to cancel. Okay, and so we're allowed actually to throw this term away. The second term it would be sum minus 1 to the f, integral d3k of n over 2 pi cubed. OK, now we've got a k downstairs. OK, and we have a, uh, a quarter. Uh, and we have m i squared of x. OK. OK, so this piece is quadratically divergent. Okay, and this quadratic divergence is really a relative of the quadratic divergences I talked about for the Higgs and other things. Okay, this is a sort of standard quadratic divergence. This would be a term in, this would correspond, we'll see, to a term in the potential for x, which goes like x squared. It's like a mass squared for x squared. It's quadratically divergent. But it turns out that for the theory we studied, if you think back to the spectrum of this model, okay, in this, this model we had some fermions with mass m squared. So we had four fermionic states. We had two bosons with mass m squared. And we had a boson with mass m squared plus, del, uh, plus uh, lambda mu squared, and a boson with m squared minus lambda mu squared. So this is one each. Okay. One each. And so the, set, the next term in this sum also cancels. Okay. And that's general. Okay, it turns out that's general for these globally supersymmetric theories that you have that sum minus 1 to the f and i squared equals 0. Okay, so the quadratic divergence is gone. Okay, and this is what uh, David spoke of at the beginning. Uh, at the beginning that, in fact, now this problem, this severe problem, is at least ameliorated in a, well, ameliorated in a very dramatic way. Maybe not enough, but maybe we should be excited already. Okay, so we now just have a log divergence. Okay, and you can evaluate this in various ways. You can work out the next term just by hand, or you can actually go back and write this formula and say, well, you can use dimensional regularization. So write this as d3 minus epsilon. I won't, do, I won't put the two that uh, speed likes. Okay, uh, and you can just work this out, and you find that, in fact, this e of x, which I'll call v of x, is sum minus 1 to the f m i to the fourth at log m i m i over some cutoff with a coefficient which I believe is 32 pi squared. Okay. And, this is the, and this is the Coleman-Weinberg formula. Okay. So as I said, so it's an exercise I recommend. You need to rec if you do it the way I've written it here, it's not always the way it's done. You, just, you need, when you do this, you need just to remember the gamma half is square root of pi, and then you can do everything and get that formula. Okay. So, uh, all right, so, so, this, so this, is, this is V of X. And in our case, right away, we can see how this is going to behave. Okay, so for large X, okay, the masses of the various fields are all going to grow, right? So if, large, if X is large, this A will have a very large mass. Okay, a Y will become light. Okay, but the characteristic mass scale will be X, and you just find that for large X, V of X, is proportional to log x squared with a positive coefficient. Okay, you can just work a slightly harder and find and construct the potential for all x. And what you find, let's put it here because I don't like. You can see it. So what you find is the potential looks like this. Here, here is x. Here is b. Okay, the, we have some. Here's our mu to the fourth here, and the potential looks something like this, growing slowly logarithmically, uh, at, uh, asymptotically, with a minimum at x equals 0. Okay? And in particular, this minimum at x equals 0 means means that the R symmetry is unbroken. Okay? Now, 
So we learn a lot from this exercise. I mean, it's a nice little exercise, but this R symmetry breaking is something we might not be that happy about. Okay? And in fact, there's an almost theorem due to David Shi that says in models like this, if all the if all fields have R charge only zero or two, that the R symmetry remains unbroken, that the R symmetry is unbroken at the minimum of the potential. Now, there are loopholes to that, which have been pointed out by El Shadmi and others recently, but roughly speaking, that holds correctly. But she also gave us an, uh, uh, examples of models which do break the R symmetry. Uh, so a simple example has the following structure. Uh, So this is just sort of just to write it down on the board to show you that it exists. Okay, there exist models where in, the subscripts here indicate the R, the R charges of the fields. So you'll notice everything adds up to R charge two. You'll notice that the fields don't all have R charge zero or two. And it turns out that when you calculate the potential that for some values of the parameters, okay, the potential will do instead, instead of rising at the origin, will show a dip and then rise. Okay, and you find a, a broke, spontaneously broken R symmetry. So there's no fundamental obstacle to, to breaking R symmetry in these models. Okay, now, so I'd like to turn now, this is not quite what we'd like, I claim. I claim what we'd like is we'd like to understand the supersymmetry breaking dynamically. Okay, so this goes back, as I said in my first lecture, to implementing these two notions of naturalness. One, this Tuftian notion that there's some small parameter okay, which in which a, in, in, in limit of which the theory becomes more symmetric, but also this notion that David talked about, which we understand for the proton mass, that you can have that exponentially large hierarchies are, are natural in uh, and we argued that in supersymmetric theories they would be natural, but we'd like to see that phenomenon happen. And for that, we'd like to talk a little bit about dynamics. So I want to talk about two things. So first of all, I thought one of the reason we said that supersymmetric theories are, if you like, prone to, to these sorts of exponential hierarchies. It's the existence of these non-renormalization theorems. And I talked about the non-renormalization theorem uh, in a little bit of detail for the West Zemino model last week. But I'd like to talk about now about uh, non-renormalization theorem for gauge couplings. Because it's a little paradoxical. And I'd like to understand that. And it allows us to use some of the machinery you've seen in some of the other lectures. Okay. So what was the point? I think we sort of alluded to this last time. We said that if we look at the action for a supersymmetric non-abelian gauge theory, the Lagrangian includes a term integral d2 theta and something I could call tau. I'll put a minus a quarter here. Uh, tau uh, and w alpha squared. Okay, where tau okay, is uh, let me get my, actually, I want to put 32 pi squared, sorry. I'm going to normalize this differently than we've seen in some of the other lectures up to now. It'll just be convenient for this discussion. So I'm going to put a 32 pi squared, and tau is 8 pi squared over g squared plus i theta. Okay, and theta, we didn't really talk about this in detail, but if I have this imaginary coupling here, the real part gives the f mu nu squared in the action. Okay, the theta leads to theta f of dual. So this is the theta term we're familiar with in non-abelian gauge theories. Okay, and written this way, okay, tau is a complex field. Tau is a complex object. 
Okay? And following Cyberg, we can promote it to a field. Okay, so we can think of it as the expectation value of a field of a field. Okay. And in that case, what we know is that, say, in the superpotential, or in anything involving D2 theta, tau must appear holomorphically. So, okay. so what does that say for the gauge coupling itself? So imagine we're computing some kind of effective action. I'll describe a little bit later what, in a moment what kind of effective action, how I might do this. But imagine I'm computing some kind of effective action, and I'm computing the renormalization of W alpha squared, of the W alpha squared term. And so what can appear? So, at one, so the tree level, I have my, you know, I have the, what I've got here, this minus 1 over 32 pi squared. And then I have tau W alpha squared. Okay. Uh, but in the next order, I have just some constant times W alpha squared. Okay, so that's perfectly fine. That's a holomorphic function of tau. It doesn't disturb anything. Okay, but beyond this, I'm not, there's nothing else I'm allowed to write. So I could try and write something like 1 over tau W alpha squared. Okay, but all those who are, who are here who have paid attention to Nikita's lecture certainly know that that can't be. Okay, and why can't that? Anyone know why that can't be? What's wrong with that? It has to do with this theta. Okay, so theta, so in perturbation theory, I probably learned this first from David. In perturbation theory, there's a symmetry under which theta goes to theta plus a constant. And that's related to the fact that this FF dual is a total derivative, is a total, is an inter, is a total divergence. So this is the fact that FF dual is partial mu of some k mu, some object k mu. Okay? So there's no sensitivity in perturbation theory to this quantity theta. Theta can't show up anyway. So because of that, we're not allowed this term or anything afterwards. Okay? So I've just proven for you that there's only a one root renormalization of the coupling constant in okay, of the coupling constant in this theory. Now you, go, you can then go look, look up in, in papers and books the beta function in this theory and you'll quickly see that there is in fact a, a two loop beta function. Okay, so how do we understand that? Okay, so let me try and explain in a simple way where that comes from. And this will lead, for example, to a statement about some, exact, some sort of statement about exact behavior of the beta function, but we'll try and understand what. Okay. So in order to make sense of this, the problem, the, if you start thinking about this a little bit, you realize that one issue is uh, this theory, of course, is the theory, I, the theory, well, I've erased the theory, but the theory is, requires some regularization, okay? And the regularization, you might worry, spoils the sort of holomorphy uh, argument, and it does. And, but we wanted to understand how, and so we can introduce a regulator. Okay, so there are lots of ways we could do introduce a regulator. We could do dimensional regularization or supersymmetric dimensional regularization. But there's a regular re regulator due, I believe, to Murayama and Arkani Hamid, Hamed, which is to just embed this, to consider, if you like, the n equals 4 supersymmetric theory. And I should say, at, at the moment, I'm just regulating the pure gauge theory without any chiral fields, which, for, which already raises this paradox. <laughs> So n equals 4 supersymmetric theory, okay, and we've heard about that a little bit in some of the other lectures. And what does that consist of? From the point of view of n equals 1, this is a theory with a gauge field, so there's some w alpha, and there are three adjoints. Okay, so the three adjoints. And in this theory, we have uh, and the, the action in this theory is, okay, it's again my one, minus 1 over 32 pi squared d2 uh, 
theta tau w alpha squared. There are the kinetic terms for these adjoints. Okay. And there is, uh, and then there's a superpotential for the adjoints. So this is, this I might write, uh, I'm going to put a 1 over g squared here. I'm actually going to drop the tau for now because it just complicates matters. And I'll just put minus 1 over 4g squared. Okay, I have some 1 over g squared in front of, uh, and I'll put a 4 in front of phi f, phi f dagger phi f, and I have a super potential d2 theta and a 1 over g squared again, uh, and uh, an f a b, uh, that's right, f a b c phi a 1 phi b 2 phi c 3. Okay, now that theory you check you has, why, why do we call it n equals 4? Well it has four supersymmetries and a way to understand this is there's an R symmetry. Okay, there's a, well first of all there's an R symmetry of the kind we usually kind we talk about where these guys have R charge two-thirds. Okay, so this is the U1 R symmetry but there's really a larger R symmetry here, an SU4 symmetry. And essentially what that does is it, it, it mixes up the four types of adjoint fermions. The adjoint fermion associated with the gauge field and the three adjoint fermions here. Okay? And written like this, while the n equals 4 supersymmetry is not manifest, the SU4 is almost manifest. And you can certainly see it at the level of the fermion kinetic terms. Okay. Now, among the many interesting features of this theory, one, the one we've heard about quite a bit already, is this theory is finite. Okay. So, at the level of the beta function, you can just easily see that the beta function at one loop is zero, and you can check that it's zero, uh, zero at two loops, and you can try and think about constructing an all order, some kind of simple all orders argument. Okay. But this is a finite theory, and the theory remains finite if I, I add mass terms for the, for the, for the phi's. No. Okay. So that's a, uh, you know, that, so that in itself is rather remarkable. And the low energy theory is just a pure n equals one gauge theory. Okay. So, Okay, so that's also, uh, so, that, so we have a regulator now for our pure n equals one gauge theory, and we can ask what's going on with this one looper normalization. Okay, so we can actually, so if we look back here, if we add these mass terms, okay, what would I do? I'd add the mass terms here maybe. So I could put mi phi i phi i plus complex conjugate, these would be the mass terms. And I can now try and make the sort of holomorphy argument I made before. The problem is that the way I've presented the theory, G no longer appears holomorphically. So here I have, I could put my tau back, okay? Things look for holomorphic in tau, but they're not holomorphic in tau here, okay? So what do I do? Well, there's an easy fix for that, okay? So the easy fix for that is just to rescale phi i to get rid of this G here. So I can let phi i goes to g to the uh, right, minus two-thirds phi i, okay? That gets rid of this. It turns this into g to the two-thirds, okay? But that term doesn't have to be holomorphic. That's fine, okay? And now my low energy action, whatever I compute, has to be a holomorphic function of tau and this m, and I'm going to give this m a label because it's something funny, and I'll just put in one mass and I'll call it m sub h for holomorphic. So it has to be a holomorphic function of tau and m sub h. Okay? And now the arguments I gave before about renormalization have to be correct. So for example, now I have 8 pi squared over g squared, say, of some m1. This is m1 is now my regulator mass is 8 pi squared 
over g squared of m2 plus the beta function. The beta function in this theory is 3n for sun, 3n log of m1 over m2. And I'll put an h here. Okay, and that better be right. Okay, I don't now. I now have a regulator. The expressions are all holomorphic, and that's fine. Okay, and I claim that's the right answer. Okay, what's puzzling? What's the puzzle, or what's the resolution of the puzzle? Well, let's look back at M H, and let's look at this funny kinetic term. Okay, so there's a physical mass in this theory. There's a mass. Of, there's the, my regulator mass is some number. It's 752 GeV or whatever it is. Okay. And the, but the physical mass is the mass of this thing. Okay, so the mass of the, what I can call the physical mass, and physical, is g to the two thirds. Okay, of m h. Okay, so I can rewrite, or I can invert that, and write m h as g to the minus two thirds m physical. And so I can just plug this back in here. Okay, and now in fact, now in fact, I do have corrections. And, in, and for example, the beta function I can evaluate the beta function. I can take this expression. I can evaluate uh, 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 m physical d by d d m physical of g. Okay, that's the beta function. And I'll find, in a way that you can, probably can't read, put it over here. So I'll find that beta of g is what I expect, minus 3n g cubed over 16 pi squared but with a correction which looks like this, 1 minus 2n g squared over 16 pi squared. Okay? And that's the beta function. This is, in fact, the famous NSVZ beta function. Okay? And, for example, you can now check, you can expand this, the, this in powers of g squared and check. If you look it up, you'll find that you get the correct to the correct two loop beta function. Okay? Now, so at this point we could say, well, what does this mean though? Okay, because someone told you that in fact the beta function beyond beyond two loops is scheme dependent. Okay, so where's what's the scheme? Well the scheme happened here. Okay, the scheme happened when I wrote this expression for M physical, and I told you that this is, and you might say, okay, good, we, that's the answer, except that if you ask where is the, where, what is the mass of this field, what is the mass of this regulator field, it's not exactly this. So the, so the pole, if you like, and the propagator for that field, or whatever you like, is, it has corrections. At one loop, you can already compute them. I forget what it is, but there's some finite correction. So I might say, oh, what I should do is define the scheme which is the d by d, the actual pole mass, and then there will be all sorts of corrections here. Okay. Or you might say, well, maybe I just don't like this scheme, but I just will put some other function of some g squared times some function of g squared. Okay, so done like this, there are, again, as you would expect, a set, an infinite set of schemes. Okay, but we've traced We've traced this puzzle, okay, of, you know, we, there's no real puzzle with this one loop holomorphy, okay, this one looper normalization, okay, and we have a very nice kind of laboratory, if you like, in which to, in which to play with it. Okay, now I don't have time to, I didn't really have time to say that much about this, I don't have same, to time to say more, but I think it's kind of an interesting application of a lot of the things that we've talked about and that other lecturers have talked about here. So I want to go on and do one last thing. Maybe, you mentioned the scheme dependence beyond two loops. Maybe you can tell, can you change zeros? Uh, can you change signs? Not, not, not in the range where I trust the expansion. Not in the range where I can do the expansion. So you could ask, what's this pole there, for example? And it's not any place that, 
Uh, you know, it's not in any place where you, where you know what you're doing. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk now a little bit more about supersymmetric dynamics. And since we've talked about the pure gauge theory, okay, let's start with the pure gauge theory. So the pure supersymmetric gauge theory is a theory with a gauge uh, boson and a gageno. Okay, so let's do SUN, for example. Okay, and without knowing very much what we might, what we might we expect to happen in this theory, well, okay, so this is a the kind of theory that even before you, anybody talked about supersymmetry, you might have talked about, you might have tried to solve it on the lattice, you might have tried to do various things. And if you were guessing, what you would have guessed by analogy to QCD is, one, that there would exist a mass gap. Okay. And two, that uh, there would be a condensate, just like, just like we talked about core condensates early on, there would be a condensate of the Gaginos. Okay. So the first one, if we assume that's true, tells us something important. Okay. It tells us that supersymmetry isn't broken is not spontaneously broken. And can anyone say why? What, what happens if we break, if supersymmetry is broken, what does the spectrum have to have? A Goldstino, it has to have a massless fermion. Okay, so there's no candidate Goldstino. Okay, now I haven't proven that for you. If I, okay, if I proved it at this level, I would be famous and collect the million dollars and so on. Okay, uh, but, um, but we'll accept that for the moment. Okay, the significance of this statement, okay, in QCD, in ordinary QCD, the significance of this was the existence of the pi mesons as, as, as pseudo Goldstone bosons. Uh, but here, the significance is that we break a discrete symmetry of the model. So what's that symmetry? Okay, so classically, this theory has a U1 symmetry, it's an R, an R symmetry under which lambda goes to e to the i alpha lambda. It's probably the simplest of the R symmetries we could write. Okay, it rotates the lambdas but not the a mu's. Okay, and it rotates the supercharges. Okay, so quantum mechanically though, so this symmetry is anomalous. So if I draw a diagram, here's the symmetry current. Here are the gauge bosons. This has an anomaly. Okay, it's not a good symmetry of the theory. Okay, but uh, but there's a discrete symmetry left over, and this this one can understand by thinking about instantons. So we talked a little bit about instantons, and you heard a lot about instantons from Nikita. So an instanton in this theory has zero modes. It has two n zero modes. Okay, and correspondingly, there's an expectation value for an expression with 2n Giginos. Okay, and this breaks this U1 down to a subgroup, a, Z2 sub, a Zn subgroup. So this is broken down to Zn. Okay, and people say a lot of things about Gigino condensation. There are zillions of papers about it. But the, really, the, the only thing I know that sort of characterizes it, uh, that characterizes Gageno condensation, are the, this, this existence of a mass gap, okay, uh, and the breaking of some discrete R symmetry. Okay? And that's a, what I'm going to sort of extract, what I'm going to say is sort of a, a, a generally of interest. Okay? And we don't have enough time to talk about the dynamics of this, but what's remarkable is that by sort of conjectured all this happens, you can prove it in the sense that you know, physicists are happy with proofs. Okay? So you can prove that these things happen. Okay? And this is a, uh, by basically consider, by, by exploiting
So we can prove the genome condensation. By considering, uh, uh, by considering other gauge theories, so by considering Susie gauge theories with matter, and a little like the spirit of this argument I made with the n equals four, adding mass terms for some of the matter and exploiting holomorphy. So you can add mass terms. Study the theory for small mass, and it turns out in that, in that limit, most of these theories you can understand, and you can even you can calculate, make calculations in a systematic way, and then use holomorphy to extend the result to, to large masses. So, in, so if you like to decouple this matter. So lots of things I may talk about, or certainly the phenomenology I'll talk about won't be on such solid ground. But the theory of this story is on quite solid, on, is on quite solid ground and subject to all kinds of independent and rather non-trivial tests. Okay? I'd like to add, make one more statement about this. So having done this, having introduced theories like this, you could, one thing I don't like about these theories is I don't like the fact that the Gigino, and you'll see why in a minute, I don't like the fact that the Gigino condensate is an object of, uh, of dimension three, I'd like to have order parameters for breaking discrete R symmetries which had lower dimension. And it turns out not to be difficult to construct models like that. Uh, and I think I'm, well, I'll just write, it, write, write down uh, as you know, possibly a homework problem if you want, but just to, to show that I'm not totally inventing this, to say that you can write down theory. So for example, if I have a theory with SUN, an SUN gauge theory, with NF flavors of quarks, so NFQ bar and Q, with NF flavors, and a sing coupled to a singlet, so I have W is lambda Q bar Q, uh, S Q bar Q, plus some kappa uh, S cubed. Okay, this theory has a, has a discrete symmetry, a discrete R symmetry, which is Z3N minus NF, And it's broken, completely broken, by S and lambda lambda. And again, notice this is a theory with no dimensionful coupling constants. All the couplings are dimensionless. OK, so this theory has these features I described. OK, it breaks. So I'm just going to sort of think of this as a generalized Gigino condensation. Okay, uh, where I have these order parameters, this order parameter, okay, of dimension one. Okay. So having said that, let me talk now a little bit about supersymmetry breaking. And I want to talk about one other um, aspect of supersymmetry breaking, which is metastability. So over the last few years, starting with the work of interlocator Shi and Zyberg, We've learned that we should think about uh, supersymmetry breaking not or not as a not, not, think, not look for stable supersymmetry breaking, but look for metastable SUSY breaking. Okay, and so what what we can understand that by thinking about our Rafferty model. Okay, so we had this theory which looked like let x and I won't worry about coupling constant now a squared minus mu squared plus m a y. Okay, and I said, okay, it was important we had this continuous R symmetry. Okay, that was required by this theorem of Nelson and Seiberg. Okay, but we also know from thinking about gravity and, and more specifically in string theory that we don't expect, and we, it's almost, it's essentially a theorem, that there should be no continuous global symmetries. So expect no continuous global symmetries in nature. Okay, but certainly in string theory, okay, we encounter discrete symmetries. Okay. 
they could probably all be thought of as gauge symmetries, but for my purposes, all I care about is we have these, uh, we, we have discrete symmetries, okay? And in particular, discrete R symmetries are rather common. Okay, so what does an R symmetry do, right? An R symmetry is something that rotates a superpotential, right? It rotates things, uh, not the super, it rotates the, well, it does rotate W, but it rotates the supercharges. The supercharges are fermions, okay? And more importantly, what it does is it rotates fermions differently than bosons. So, for example, if I start with a theory in a higher dimension, okay, which has some kind of symmetry, so you've all seen various kinds of orbifolds based on geometries, for example, that look like this, where I have some kind of symmetry of a rotation by 30 degrees. So there's some symmetry. I can rotate this by 30 degrees. Okay, it's a nice symmetry. It's a symmetry. It's got to be a good symmetry. It's a symmetry of a higher dimensional space-time. Okay, it's related to rotational invariance. Okay, and at low energy, because it's a rotation, okay, it acts on fermions, four-dimensional fermions, differently than bosons. Okay, in particular, it acts non-trivially on four-dimensional fermions. Okay, so this is an example of a discrete R symmetry. Okay, so discrete R symmetries are are in fact rather ubiquitous, at least in simple string constructions. So they're sort of plausible. Okay. So in this case, what I could do, uh, the simplest thing I could do is I could just take my, my continuous symmetry under which, for example, x went to e to, the two, e to the i alpha x and replace alpha by some discrete number, 2 pi over, uh, over n. Okay. And in that case, I could add to the superpotential, for example, a term like x to the uh, n plus 1 over m to some large scale. Let's take it to the Planck scale, n minus 2. And there will be lots of other things. Okay? And when I do that, my equations before, before I couldn't solve the equations dw dx equals 0 and dw dy equal, dw dy equals 0, but now I can. So the equation dw dx equals 0, for example, will have a solution where x to the n uh, is equal to uh, mu squared, up to some constant, mu squared mp to the n minus 2. Okay? And so there will be some supersymmetric vacuum far away. So in terms of these kind of pictures I was drawing before, okay, I'll have, a, I have some situation like this. Okay, so I have my, I still have, nothing changes much near here, near the origin. Okay, but far away, there will be a supersymmetric minimum. Okay, and we don't have time to talk about theory of tunneling, but this thing is very far away, and the lifetime for tunneling will turn out, will, if you calculate, it turns out to be unimaginably long for sort of plausible values of mu. And so this, so this was an example of metastable SUSY breaking. If the universe somehow finds itself over here, at some point, it's going to sit there for uh, you know, as long as we might care. Okay? And this looks generic, OK? It looks generic because we don't expect these exact symmetries. And what we have here, in fact, is an approximate symmetry as a consequence of the approximate continuous symmetry as an accidental consequence of this discrete symmetry. Okay? So that's first aspect of supersymmetry breaking. The second aspect is the question of dynamics. So, so the simple, so there are lots of beautiful models of this kind of metastable. Uh, Dynamical, of metastable dynamical SUSY breaking, starting with this work of ISS. But just for illustrative purposes and for illustrative reasons that actually I think in the end end up being surprisingly good, let me describe something really simple where I just take this x uh, mu squared, and I replace this by x, and I have my lambda a squared still. But my mu squared I replace by minus uh, w alpha squared over, and I've got my, my dimensions right, uh, over m squared, over m, oops, did I do this right? Yes, mp to the, f w alpha squared, yeah, over mp squared. Uh, uh, plus the rest of the stuff, some m a y. Okay, so that's my earlier model. But this w alpha 
is the field strength of some new gauge group. <coughs> Say some SUN, it doesn't really have to be SUN, but let me. Some new SUN gauge group, okay? And what do we know? We know that that gauge group, if I'm imagining for the moment I don't have matter there, that gauge group gives rise to an expectation value for lambda lambda or an expectation value of W alpha squared. So this is some capital lambda cubed. Okay? And now I have my earlier model, okay? but I have a lambda cubed, by the way, as I should write, is, you know, is the usual thing. It's maybe mp cubed exponent minus 8 pi squared over b naught. Uh, in fact, I can put n g squared of mp. Okay, so, it, so I have this kind of dyna dynamical hierarchy like I want. Uh, and, uh, and this generates then my mu squared, this mu squared parameter I had before. Mu squared is lambda cubed. Uh, actually, I've got this wrong. I'm sorry, it's lambda m over mp. Okay, so that's dynamical Suzy breaking. Okay, this is about as simple as it could be. Okay, and every piece of this, I say, I can give you some almost rigorous sort of mathematical justification for. Okay. Okay, and these models are referred to. This is a term that Eva Silverstein invented as retrofitted models, okay? And the sort of idea is we took the kind of older Rafferty model and we jazzed it up a little bit and now it works again. It does what we want, okay? So, uh, so this is a very simple illustration of dynamical supersymmetry breaking, okay? Now, so we, kind of, we have almost everything we want. I should say, by the way, once we start doing this, we can do all kinds of things. So we can generate, for example, this new term. Okay, we could generate again, this new term could be, for example, this parameter s. It could, might be this s squared over mp. Uh, yes, right? It could be something like that. We can do all kinds of things once we have this. It's a little embarrassing how easy it becomes to try and build models of dynamical SUSY breaking with all kinds of features that you might like. Okay. So, uh, all right, so, uh, okay. I guess that's, yeah, that's good enough. Okay. So we have almost everything we want. I think I now I'd like to talk about models. Let me talk, maybe one more thing I should discuss. Okay, so I've mentioned the cosmological constant already. Okay, and I wanna talk about it a little, uh, for a moment in this context, in the context of supersymmetric models. And for that, what I'd like to do, want to introduce one other thing, which is already figured again in a lot of the lectures here, okay, which is supergravity. And I want to talk for a moment about n equal one supergravity. And I just want to note a couple of features. So obviously I'm not going to derive for you the, the, the supersymmetric, the general supersymmetric Lagrangian, but I do want to say it's characterized by a few things. It's the input for the, for the general n equals one supergravity Lagrangian is a superpotential, some holomorphic function of chiral fields, a Kähler potential, which generalizes the kinetic terms we've been talking about, okay, which is some gauge invariant function of the, so it involves also these e to the v's, which I'm suppressing, some gauge invariant function of the chiral fields, which is not holomorphic, and also some function fa of phi, a chiral field, uh, uh, again, a, a, a holomorphic function of the fields, which multiplies the various, uh, the various uh, gauge, gauge fields, which defines the normalization, if you like, of their kinetic terms. Okay, and this is enough to specify all the terms with, as mo with at most two derivatives in the supergravity Lagrangian. Given that, there are a couple of things. First of all, I can tell you what the, poten what, the, what the potential looks like. The scalar potential is a little more complicated, in fact, a lot more complicated than the, uh, 
than the one we've been writing up to now. It's on e to the k. I could put e to the k over np squared, but I won't remember where to put all the np's. Okay. And then it involves partial w partial phi i plus dk d phi i w. This thing is called the Kähler derivative. Uh, so, some metric, which I'll define in a moment, g i i bar and d w star d phi i bar plus d k d phi i bar w. And this is the thing, the thing I really want to point to is this minus 3 w squared. Okay, so there's a negative term here. Okay, so this is the, this is the general form of the potential in this case. Okay, the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking is this thing, so this generalizes our fi's before. In the limit, the Planck mass goes, goes to infinity, this goes away, this goes away, this also goes away, and the g I didn't define, the g, g with the indices downstairs is the Kähler metric associated with this Kähler potential. Okay, so it's this object. Okay, so it's a complicated object, we're not going to use it for anything today. Uh, it, well, we'll use it for one thing today. Okay. So, I'm just going to say this because I want you to understand why you think you should, why you should be really excited about, you know, we're all getting tired and we had a good lunch, but why you should be really excited about these retrofitted models. Okay? So, let me talk about a couple of things. If Susie is broken, Okay, because this is a local symmetry, we no longer have a massless Goldstino. We have a, instead a fermion uh, uh, gravitino, and its mass, m3 halves, is e to the k over 2. I should write an expectation value of w, this expectation value of this object. Okay. And the other thing I want you to note about this is that if supersymmetry is broken and if the cosmological constant is approximately zero, then we have the, three, the w squared is, I'll write it like this, and I'll just, I don't want to, I don't really need to write too much here, but it's a third di phi squared, or this fi squared. Okay. Okay. So, now how might that happen? So this says a couple things. Okay, so I actually should put expectation value of W. And this is rather remarkable. So first of all, notice that you might expect, why should expectation value of W be small? Well, you might say you'd like to understand, because so it is going, if, if, if SUSY is broken at a low scale, it is going to be extremely small. And you might say, well, could that be a symmetry? Well, by, by definition, this is a symmetry, if it exists, which rotates the superpotential, so it's an R symmetry. Okay, so you might say this sort of smells, again, like R symmetries might be important. Okay. Um, and, uh, okay, and the second thing you might notice about this is the order of magnitude is kind of interesting. Okay, so in my models I was describing before, in these retrofitted models, this F, Okay, is of order of this parameter mu squared, which was lambda cubed over mp. And I should have put the mp's here. So there's really a 1 over mp squared here. Okay. And what you see is, in order of magnitude, not in detail, I'm not solving, I'm making no grandiose claims, but in order of magnitude, these uh, retrofitted models predict a w, or an expectation value of w. So the w here I'm thinking of is the expectation value of whatever multiplies d2 theta. Okay? An expectation value of w of the right order to cancel the cc. Okay, so at the level of the kinds of progress that David was suggesting, I think, in the first lecture, I think I, this gets some points. Okay, and I hopefully, if we'll see how much time we have, I'll say a little more, more about it as I go along. Okay, so the time is running out, and I'm going to switch to this other mode. If I can find all the buttons, and we can find the, oops. <coughs> okay. 
it turn on? I think it's on. Yeah. It's on now. Yeah, I think so. <coughs> okay. Let's see. So could we just lower the lights? Thank you. That's great. Yeah, that, we, don't, we don't need quite that. A little light on the blackboard would be just a little light up there. You know, it's a little that. I think, well, maybe. Yeah, I think that's all right. I think that's all right. Oops, yes, thanks. Good. OK. So what I'd like to do now, OK, is I'd like to talk a little bit. See, don't worry, we only had 64 slides to go. I, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit. Now, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. We've covered a lot of the other material. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit now about mediating supersymmetry breaking. Thank you. OK, so so far I've discussed a little bit how supersymmetry might be broken from various points of view. Okay? <laughs> but that, we want to translate that into how, uh, in, in, into, uh, you know, how something plausible at low energy, something consistent with the things we know, might arise at low energies. So there we go. So you generally assume when people think about models of supersymmetry breaking that supersymmetry is broken by the dynamics of some additional fields. So I've already stuck in various kinds of additional fields. I have these x's and a's and stuff. And, uh, and what you can show is that the, the sort of this MSSM by itself, for example, the way I described it, does not break supersymmetry. Okay, so we need something else. Okay, and there are two classes of models that people talk about, gauge-mediated models and gravity-mediated models. And they're distinguished principally by the scale at which supersymmetry is broken. Okay, so if terms in the supergravity Lagrangian or more generally higher dimension operators suppressed by, say, the Planck scale are important at the weak scale, so then we need Fi to be of order, which is this DIW, uh, should be of order a scale TeV M Planck. Okay, or something people call M intermediate squared. This scale is around 10 to the 11th GeV. Okay, so this is a large scale. And, this, and in a rather general way, I'll think of these things as gravity mediated. It's mediated. Sometimes think people have something more specific in mind. If some lower scale, then people usually call this gauge mediated, or this will fall into a class of things called gauge mediated. Okay? Uh, and then we can think of Fi as, for example, approximately DIW. Okay? Uh, and in the low scale case, we expect the soft breaking effects at low energy should be calculable, okay, without requiring some kind of complicated ultraviolet completion. Uh, and the intermediate scale case, this case, requires some, something like string theory. It requires something where you can re control Planck scale effects. Okay. So let me say a few words about gravity mediation first. Uh, not because I, well, not necessarily because it's the most likely thing to be true, but because it's, also, it's, it's rather simple to describe. Okay? So we can take some kind of simple model, like one of our Rafferty models here. I, I haven't worried too much about the details, and I've just written some f, f is some, some, like this parameter mu squared before. It's like a Goldstino decay constant times x plus w naught. I think I borrowed this notation from Akomogortsky and Xi and others. Uh, and uh, and then we have this W naught so that we make the cosmological constant small at the minimum in the way of the potential in the way I've described. I'm going to su I could suppose, for example, that the Kähler potential, we remember the Kähler potential is one of the inputs we need, is say x dagger x plus some um, phi i dagger phi i for all the other fields. So these fields in particular would be, say, the quark and lepton superfields, the Higgs fields. Okay? Uh, in that case, this simple model. Okay, generates masses right away for all the partners of everybody. All the squarks and sleptons, for example, gain mass. If I look at dw d phi i plus dk d phi i w squared, this is one of the terms I wrote down before in the supergravity Lagrangian, then if w has an expectation value, there's uh, the dk d phi is phi star, okay, so I have dk d phi w naught, and I square it. So I just have a mass term right away for all the superfields. In fact, the masses are in this formula, roughly equal to the gravitino mass. Okay? So this is just a very simple model for how uh, all the squarks could gain mass. Uh, these A terms, which I described, the terms which are cubic in the superfields, uh, arise, for example, if I have W is W naught plus Y phi cubed. They arise from all sorts of places, but for example, minus 3W squared includes then a term minus 3W naught Y phi phi phi. So we'd have an A term proportional, in this case, to the form of the superpotential. 
Okay, and gay genome masses could arise if there's a coupling, if this F function, this gauge coupling function I described before, uh, contains a, a term XW alpha squared. Okay? So in fact, people by taking this kind of simple model uh, have for years studied something called M sugra. Okay, this is a model with three parameters, uh, M naught squared, M one half, and A, okay, which I've written here. Okay, so I have the masses for the Giginos, common masses for the Giginos at some high energy scale, uh, common masses for all the scalars, and an A term proportional to the superpotential. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and, and one can then make a model like this. One, as I say, one says, takes this as the form at some high energy scale, and one then evolves it down to low energies. Uh, but, and this does all kinds of wonderful things, I should say, because, for example, I talked about the problem of flavor in, uh, in supersymmetric models, and if I assume this form, the problem is solved. Okay, that we, you know, for example, the masses are all approximately functions just of gauge quantum numbers, uh, and uh, all those bad processes I described are, are, are suppressed. Okay, however, there's no real reason to assume this simple form I took before. Okay, so in particular, for example, this form for the Kähler potential, Okay. So if I just complicate the Kähler potential a little bit, and I've added various kinds of stuff here, okay, uh, then this generates this full set of soft breaking parameters I chose before. So I said we can have 105 parameters. I haven't counted the parameters here, but you can easily check that I can fill out that whole parameter space okay, by choosing the, these gammas and A's. Okay. So all the problems are here unless you give me some explanation why these gamma, these, these, these gammas at some energy scale, scale are small. And I don't want to claim that you couldn't. Okay. The, the obvious thing to think about is maybe there is some kind of approximate flavor symmetry which suppresses these terms. I'm not going to offer any theory of that now. Okay. But just to, this is just a little quick tour of what these theories are about. And you're going to hear Again, for Maria, various constraints on models of this type. You'll hear something, a sort of generalization of this called the constrained MSSM or the CMSSM. You'll hear about various versions of this. But this is sort of what, one of the things that sort of motivates that kind of construction, this sort of, this sort of model based on supergravity. Okay, there are other issues to worry about. Uh, Gravitino overproduction, problems associated with moduli. These also arise in gauge mediation, which I'll describe uh, shortly. Okay. So now I want to turn to this other possibility of this, this process of, of gauge mediation. Okay. And the main premise here is that in the limit that, they, uh, that the gauge couplings vanish, the hidden and visible sectors decouple. And as a simple model, the simple model of this is called minimal gauge mediation. I suppose I have some field X. This is like this X I encountered before, which has a scale, an expectation value for its scalar and F component. And X is coupled to a vector-like set of fields, say, transforming as a 5 and a 5 bar of SU5. So that means a lepton doublet, L, and an anti-doublet, L bar, and similarly triplet Q and Q bar. Okay, and I put some coupling constants in here. And in that case, with this assumption, very, various things happen. So what's going to happen here? Remember, X has an F component. So because X has an F component, well, let's suppose X didn't have an F component. Let me start like that. If X didn't have an F component, this little X would give rise to supersymmetric masses for all these fields. This F component splits them, okay? And so now, and because they carry gauge quantum numbers, uh, eventually the ordinary quarks and leptons can learn about them. So for example, Gaginos, the gluino, for example, can couple to one of these quarks and its squark partner. And I can close this diagram up like this. Okay, I use the fact that uh, probably not because can people see it all? No, probably should turn on the light then. We haven't quite found the right balance here. Can we have the light for just a moment? Can we have the light for just a, yeah? Or okay, yeah, it's yeah. I guess it's totally invisible. Thank you. Okay. Well, let me put it over here where the blackboard shows a little better. We don't need that much. So I, anyway, in my graph, I have a, a genome comes in, emits one of these Qs, and its partner, its scalar partner. I can close this diagram up. If you want to work out the details, I can close it up by an insertion of F here and an insertion of X over here. Okay? And that gives rise to a genome mass. 
Okay, and that gay genome mass, in fact, this is a really easy calculation to do, goes like alpha over pi, alpha i over pi for whatever gay genome I have, uh, and then it goes like f over x. And interestingly, in this simple model, the lambdas, these, these little lambdas, cancel out. Okay, yeah, actually, it's, you know, this maybe should work. Okay, and similarly, squarks and sleptons can gain mass. So, for example, a squark can come in, an ordinary squark, Let's put Q-twit also, we just know we're not talking about these guys. Okay, it can emit, for example, a gauge boson, and it can couple to stuff involving, the, uh, in, involving these Q and Q-bar fields. Okay, so it can sort of learn that supersymmetry is broken. Okay, and this is a, you know, there are several diagrams, and they're very, these can be just evaluated directly, or there are various tricks that one can use to evaluate them. And you obtain a formula, okay, uh, thank you. You obtain a formula for them, uh, which, let's see, I'm sorry, here we go. Okay, so a formula for the squarks and sleptons, okay, where as I said, the, as, as they must, in this approximation, the, the masses depend just on the gauge quantum numbers. Uh, uh, so they, uh, on their gauge quantum numbers, so they involve the coupling constants, it's two loop, the effects are two loop in that diagram over there. So, uh, so it involves alpha squared, Okay, and the various charges, C3 and C2, are appropriate Casimirs, and Y is the hypercharge. Okay, uh, and this parameter lambda is the same parameter that appeared for the gay genomes, it's Fx over X. Okay, so we got some very, this model is a, is a very simple, you know, kind of one parameter description of uh, fields. Okay, so we one parameter for, uh, one parameter describes the masses of the three gay genomes and the squarks and sleptons. Um, Flavor changing neutral currents are automatically suppressed. Uh, CP conservation in this simple model is automatic. It's not automatic in many of the generalizations. Uh, this model, if it's written, it can't generate a mu term, which we need for the Higgs. Uh, but, and so we need some further structure. And I've already described for you, so I'm not going to take too much about it. I've already described for you how I might get that structure with this sort of retrofitting that I described earlier. So there are various ways we might generate this mu term. And I, I want to stress this. There are lots of super this gauge mediation may well be, uh, well, various forms of gauge mediation are being uh, very much stressed by LHC experiments, but the theoretical arguments against gauge mediation being the, uh, uh, around this mu term, at least, I think, are, are red herring. Okay, and one can generalize this. I don't really have time to talk about this very much, but, you know, what doesn't, this was a very simple set of assumptions. This structure that we assumed here, we could assume more complicated representations, we could assume more x's, we could assume some kind of retrofitting to generate, rather than having this x, we could have uh, explicit mass terms arising for some of these fields. All these things would alter features of, uh, of these models and we can consider a more general set of models. And in fact, a lot of the LHC work, the, the uh, Fermilab, the C, uh, CDF and D0 had already restricted, greatly constrained these models. Uh, and actually, a lot of the constraints, from, the new constraints from LHC are on this more general set of models. Okay, so um, that's it for, for this. And now we get to skip over lots of things because we said everything I want to say here. So as I said, it's not so bad as I made it sound. Uh, okay, and I want to finish up by coming back to s this question of naturalness and by, you know, kind of walking dangerously uh, in areas where David told me not to tread. Uh, and I want to think again about, I want to think a little bit about naturalness and sort of where we are in these last uh, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So, um, already by the end of the LEP program, there were good reasons to be concerned about supersymmetry. Okay, and we said that, and we started, we said yesterday that the, the most natural scale for low energy supersymmetry would seem to be MZ. Uh, and the absence of any direct signal, the failure to discover the Higgs, the problem. The, so direct signals, I should say already, here I have in mind Fermilab mainly, CDF and D0. Uh, the failure to discover the Higgs at LEP. Uh, problem of CP violation, which I mentioned. Uh, the absence of standard model in various kinds of places. I didn't talk about this process, but it's similar to some of the others I've described, and it's a little harder to understand. Uh, this is the decay of a B quark to a strange quark plus a photon, uh, which, which the standard model predicts, reproduces quite nicely. 
uh, the non-observation of proton decay, all suggested that supersymmetry of present was working quite hard to hide itself. Okay? Uh, and the, this naturalness argument, these naturalness arguments we've been making were also, you know, a good reason to question them, uh, associated mainly with the dark energy. Okay? And, and what has sort of sharpened this is the emergence of the landscape, as and I'm stressing for David the use of the word plausible, okay? as a plausible concept sharpen these concerns. Okay. So I'll say more about what, in what sense, what I mean by plausible uh, as we go on. Okay. Okay. So of course the last year these concerns have been sharpened. The LHC has quickly excluded broad swaths of the SUSY parameter space uh, and near TEV limits are common. And uh, Michael Peskin made a remark at, at the, in Mumbai that summer already looking at the early data uh, saying that no reasonable person could view the, the supersymmetry exclusions without concluding that we need to change our perspective. Okay? And, what he, and he had in mind various things, including just that this MSS, this, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, MSUGRA or things like that, but he was already beyond that. And he added the question, what uh, new perspective is called for? And that question is the question I'm going to leave with you as we conclude uh, shortly. Okay? But I'd like to at least provide some ideas for how uh, one might think about this issue, some of the things that I've been thinking about. So one of the things I haven't talked about, and which is, not, which is earlier in these slides, is uh, that I, I sort of indicated why in the MSSM you might feel that, uh, that, we are, that the things are already rather tuned. And I indicated tunings of a factor of 100 or even worse, just from looking at the problem of the Higgs mass. Okay? But, uh, so one approach is certainly to say just, well, we're looking in the wrong place. The MSSM is not where we should be looking. And I think actually, I, I'm sorry, I would like the lights again for a moment. Um, and uh, go ahead the lights again. So, so just let me mention two things. I stressed when we did our, when we talked about the Higgs mass uh, yesterday, uh, Friday, I stressed that, the, uh, that what, what's important, what's leading to all these problems, is that the quartic coupling of the Higgs in the MSSM is very small. It's this g squared plus g prime squared over 8. Okay? And we could try and fix that by adding a singlet to the model, or something else. We could add something else to the model. So something, one thing you might try and do is add SHUHD. Okay, so that's a singlet with some coupling lambda. And then dw ds squared right, is lambda squared h u h d squared. Okay, so this is a new quarter coupling, a new contribution to the quarter coupling. Okay, and, uh, and what I want to advertise here, okay, so all, mostly we're running advertisements in these last few minutes, is that, okay, people have studied this model in the past and had and, and it doesn't improve things that much, okay? But when they do this, what they usually do, what they did in the past is they wanted to say the expectation value of S should explain, so lambda times the expectation of that S would be mu, and they were interested in this in an explanation, as an explanation of this parameter mu. And I said, I don't care about that. Uh, and in particular, so they didn't want to add mu, and they didn't want to add a mass term for S, but I have this retrofitting tool now. I can add masses, I can add mu, I don't care. Okay, so I think one should study this model in a more general space. And there already is some work in this direction. And I won't remember all the authors right away, but it includes people like Graham Ross, uh, Lawrence Hall, and others have considered ver ver you know, variants of this theory. So this is one direction you might, in, 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 in the area of sort of saving general naturalness. Uh, that's one. Another, and, and it's related, is another is to consider uh, small values of the stop mass. The limits on the stop mass, at least at the moment, are not as strong as on the sort of on the other masses of overall masses of the squarks. Uh, and so small masses of this improve, remember it's this mass that's the causing all the trouble. Okay? So improve this story of naturalness. And for example, coupled with these kind of ideas, okay, you may be able to, uh, to again, to improve the naturalness of these theories. Okay? 
Another direction, okay, and again, I want to advertise uh, this kind of uh, retrofitting and discrete R I talked about uh, is R parity violation. Okay, so I used to not like R parity violation, partly because I was lazy and partly because the idea of uh, R parity as an origin of dark matter was an attractive one. But in the things I've described, okay, I've talked to you about how, well, you know, we might well expect discrete R symmetries in order, be, because of nothing else, because of the cosmological constant, perhaps to, in order to satisfy this nelson seiberg criteria. So we might expect such things. And discrete, and R parity, can also protect the proton, okay? But we also know it has to be violated, okay? We know because the cosmological constant, uh, not R parity, R symmetries, have to be violated. Uh, so if they protect the proton mass, they can only protect the uh, proton lifetime, okay? They can only protect it so well, okay? But <coughs> things can also be naturally small, okay? This parameter, the parameter is in some sense, you know, well, it might be this W, it might be W over, okay? over mp cubed, okay? It might be something else, it might be this object's s. Why don't you give up on the blackboard? Yeah, keep trying this blackboard. Uh, it, but anyway, we have a variety of parameters that might break, account for the smallness of our parity violation. And with our parity violation, the limits on, again, the limits on superparticle masses are much weaker in general. Now, of course, there are other limits, okay? There are two processes you have to worry about. You have to worry uh, well, there are many processes involved. There are proton decay, there are things like neutron-antineutron -neutron oscillations, there are uh, what people call dibaryon decay, in which two protons collide and make a pair of K mesons, for example. So there are a variety of, uh, of constraints, but it doesn't look that hard to satisfy them. Okay, and so this is, again, another area. So I, before giving up on supersymmetry in a sort of traditionally, in a traditional natural way, I want to stress that there, you know, that there are things to explore. Okay, can we have the lights down again? Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. So I want to sort of end up by saying, well, for naturalness, there are sort of three logical possibilities. I'm going to say what I'm saying is kind of trivial here. But one is that conventional notions are correct. Okay. Uh, correction, conventional notions of naturalness within some class of models, say of the kind I started to describe, the weak scale arises without appreciable fine-tuning of parameters. Maybe we'll yet find that. Okay? Another is there is just some modest level of fine-tuning, right? And why not? Okay? And I'll actually make an argument in a minute why I might even expect such a thing. Okay, so maybe we'll discover or just fail to discover supersymmetry, more or less in some form like we imagined, with a fine-tuning of, say, a part in a thousand. Part in a thousand is kind of just on the edge of what we might be able to hope to do. Okay? Now, the problem, of course, is when you admit this, you have to decide what you think is a reasonable amount. Okay? Okay? And a sort of worst case is there's lots of tuning. Uh, and what we're going to see now over these next few years is a relatively light Higgs. And nothing else, or at least nothing else, related to understanding this question of the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay, so what is the naturalness? Why should we believe in it? Or we really could say, why should we doubt? Okay, well, there are at least some hierarchies in nature, and maybe people would want to add things to the list, for which we have symmetry or dynamical explanations. Okay, well, there's M proton over M Planck, which I didn't put in here. Uh, the weak Planck scale hierarchy, uh, notice I said we don't, uh, I said possible symmetries, we don't necessarily understand them this way. Uh, there's the weak Planck scale hierarchy, which was supersymmetry or technicolor, something like that. Yukawa, Yukawa hierarchies, which we often imagine arise either through some dynamics or through approximate flavor symmetries. But there are hierarchies for which we don't really have my much, much by way of good ideas. So there's the cosmological constant, which we talked about, and which I kind of illustrated for you on the board here. Okay, this is a part in 10 to the 120, or even with supersymmetry, it's at least a part in 10 to something like 68. Okay? There's inflation, okay? So inflation as far, well, you know, I, sometimes people yell at me when I say this, but I think it's pretty fair to say that almost every, essentially all inflationary models are tuned at least at the level of the part in 100, at least in the part level of sort of the no, one over the number of E-foldings. Okay, uh, a, a more hypothetical one is, uh, is theta QCD, okay? 
uh, which maybe we can explain with an axion, for example, but then we'd have some other hierarchy, okay, some hierarchy of the axion decay constant over the Planck scale. Okay, and another one is uh, the dark matter. So, for example, suppose the axion is the dark matter, okay, or maybe, with some, maybe in some new light state tuned for thermal production. Okay, so these are things which we, a whole set of things for which we maybe or maybe don't have good ideas. Now, all of these problems are ameliorated with supersymmetry, by supersymmetry, and some can be solved by supersymmetry. Uh, these first two, uh, to my knowledge, uh, uh, are not. not. They may be improved. In fact, they're both, they're both significantly improved by supersymmetry, okay, but not solved. Okay? So logically, we have to acknowledge, even before proposing an underlying explanation for these puzzles, that imposing notions of naturalness, we are on somewhat shaky ground. Okay? We, do, we don't know if, our ideas, if these ideas should work everywhere. Now, supersymmetry, of course, as we said from the beginning, has other attractive features, unification and dark matter. And I will try and convince you that there are even some others. Okay. Uh, in any case, this notion of naturalness is not particularly sharp. Kind of like, you know, we say, okay, if the problem is a part in 10 to the 32, well, that looks pretty bad, but where, where do we stop? Okay. Why, though, really, at some level, the question is, why should the underlying theory be natural? And I went back and thinking about these issues and looked at like what people said in old papers, and I couldn't really find a sharp idea. And I should say that when I first heard about this whole question of fine-tuning, I thought the problem was there was this being, what we were worried about is there was some being upstairs with a long beard or something, and we didn't want that being to have to work too hard to get the universe to come out right. I mean, you know, I'm not quite sure. There's something troublesome here, but exactly what it is is, is hard to make sharp. And because of that, exactly what the criterion is, exactly how much tuning might appear reasonable, uh, is also a question. So things should somehow be typical, we think, but typical of what? OK. So I want to end up by speaking of this landscape as a setting in which to think about these questions. OK. So the landscape, in some sense, has been the De Damocles sword hanging over our heads. Uh, it is, for better or worse, the most compelling explanation we have for the observed dark energy. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the explanation. I, uh, David certainly alluded to it in his opening remarks, and I'm happy in questions or something to talk about it a little bit. Okay. Now, there is some evidence, and it's pretty meager, for such the existence of, thing, of such a thing in string theory, but at least it's plausible. Okay? I don't think we would take it all that seriously were it not for this question of the cosmological constant. <coughs> what I want to do for the rest of these remarks is though, without worrying about, I'm going to sort of assume it exists. I'm not going to worry too much about how it comes about. Uh, I'm not going to worry too much about how we get from one state in this landscape to another. Uh, I will worry a little bit about it. Okay? But what I'm going to take as the lesson of the landscape, the notion that there exists this vast number of vacuum states where, which sort of scan possible values, well, scan all kinds of things, numbers of degrees of freedom, symmetries, numbers of dimensions, uh, <laughs> parameters, and so on. Uh, and that somehow the laws of nature we have observed are selected from some large ensemble of possibilities. Uh, now, the probability distribution uh, depends on all, all kinds of things which we don't know. Underlying microphysics, almost certainly cosmology, and other known features. I'll mention a couple things that are kind of simple to think about, but we certainly can't derive, and I don't know that we can hope to derive uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the underlying, some underlying distribution. Okay. Now, what about the Higgs mass? Well, ignoring tuning, we might expect the Higgs coupling to, uh, the high scale to be large. If it's selected from some distribution, then the lambda might be like pi squared or something. And then we would just evolve it down. Okay? And so, for example, if the Higgs parameters are selected anthropically, I'll use that dreaded word, then, uh, then, uh, then for example, the Higgs mass has to be large enough that the universe is still here. Okay? Uh, if, the universe, if the Higgs is too light, in the in minimal standard model, the universe decays. And this actually leaves an interesting band, which I find really dis, rather discouraging. Okay? So this is from a plot to, to John Ellis. You can't see it that well, I apologize. Uh, but this is sort of the high scale coupling, things like pi or 2 pi. And this is the, uh, this is the range of observed Higgs masses. Uh, these, these are constraints from uh, 
uh, from, so, so these are constraints from stability down here, okay? And you see, and this was mentioned, that we're actually in a region, if the Higgs is at 125 GeV, we're kind of in a natural, rather natural region. We're just high enough that we're still here. Okay, and we're kind of, you know, in a kind of rough, rather typical place. Okay, so, um, you know, maybe you'll say, well, maybe it should be at the high end. Maybe that's an evidence, some evidence. But it's kind of troubling that we're, you know, it's not, we wouldn't expect it to be lighter, and we wouldn't expect it to be too much larger than we're seeing. Okay, so it's, a, so it's I say, it's a little bit troubling. But let me now think to say a little bit, what, what, what would it mean? What, what do, I want to describe a notion of model building, which makes this kind of notion of naturalness sharp. Okay? So I want to speak of a model. So, so now this is model in the most pejorative sense. Okay? But a model is a choice of probability distributions for degrees of freedom, symmetries, parameters. Uh, and, uh, and we want to imagine, and I'm going to just imagine that you know, what we see, what, we, what we're likely to see is what's most likely within such a distribution with certain prior constraints. These might be anthropic, as in the prediction of the dark energy, or just viewed in some cases as observational facts. Okay? And predictions can arise in, this, in, such a, in such a model if some outcome is strongly favored. Okay? And in particular, models can fail. How many more minutes do I have? Five, four. Okay. Okay. Okay, but within such a model, naturalness is a precise notion. Okay, we can ask how probable a, a different something is, like low energy supersymmetry. Okay, well, so light Higgs given low energy supersymmetry or not. Okay, and the question of low energy supersymmetry is then really in this framework how common in the landscape or whatever is dynamical supersymmetry breaking versus non dynamical or the total absence of supersymmetry or what have you. Okay, and the answer to this question in particular is not known. Okay, so this is only something about, so this is the sense in which I say these are models. Okay, so let me describe three, four models. Okay, uh, so model A would be no supersymmetry below the Planck scale. And you might imagine that that's rather generic, that if you wrote down sort of, you've studied string theory in some way, you studied, say, some 2B landscape or something like that, you would find lots of non supersymmetric states, that that might be rather typical. Okay. Uh, if you suppose in model B, if I assume some non-dynamical breaking of supersymmetry, okay, and motivated by studies of 2B flux vacua due to uh, Douglas and Deneff, for example, one, one might argue that super, super potential parameters should be just uniformly distributed as complex numbers. And then you find that high-scale supersymmetry breaking is favored even by small Higgs mass and small cosmological constant. Okay, so this is one reason I would advocate thinking about dynamical supersymmetry breaking if we want to think supersymmetry has something to do with the hierarchy problem. And in fact, dynamical breaking favors lower breaking of supersymmetry. Okay? And finally, we can have dynamical breaking with discrete R symmetries. This tends to favor very low scales of supersymmetry as in, uh, as in gauge mediation. And I don't have time to do this exercise here, but this is, this is uh, you know, my 18-year-old my complains that my understanding of probability is pretty feeble, and it is, and it's not hard to think about these distributions and what they lead to. It's a pretty simple exercise. Okay. So in the landscape, the question of low energy supersymmetry is one of relative probability of dynamical supersymmetry versus non-SUSY or non-dynamical. And we just don't know enough about landscapes from any underlying theory to settle these questions from the top down. I will uh, describe one attempt at a top-down argument, and we'll make an argument for, you for supersymmetry, okay, based on these considerations, which is one of stability. So suppose we don't have supersymmetry, okay, and we believe in some kind, and we're aficionados, we're Brian Green or somebody, and we're aficionados of some kind of landscape. We're sitting here. Nearby us are lots and lots, an exponentially large number of other states, states with negative cosmological constant, to which we can potentially decay, or we would really decay to a big crunch associated with these. Uh, that doesn't sound good, okay? And you could ask, what prevents that, okay? And there's a tendency to say tunneling is small, but we, when we say tunneling amplitudes are small, it's because we usually assume something, like couplings are weak, or energy scales are large. And you could ask, for example, in, uh, in the sorts of models that people study, for uh, when they talk about landscapes, type 2B models, things of this sort. What sorts of things might generically lead to stability? And the one thing that does for sure, and almost nothing else that I can, I can tell does, is supersymmetry. 
Okay? So uh, I said this actually in the beginning when we looked at the supersymmetry algebra. I mentioned the supersymmetry algebra in uh, curved space time, okay, or in more generally in general relativity. And I said that supersymmetry algebra makes, se algebra makes sense okay, in cases where we have an asymptotically flat space time. Okay? Uh, and in those cases, I said, we, uh, in, in those cases, in the cases where, the st uh, which, which is certainly at least approximately our, our universe, uh, in those cases, uh, the universe is necessarily stable. So if supersymmetry is broken a little bit, okay, then we expect a little bit of instability. And in a very general set of models, you can show that the lifetime of the universe goes like e to the minus 2 pi squared, okay, m Planck squared over this m3 half squared, this mass I wrote down before. So, you know, in the extremes case where we imagine this is TeV, okay, this is e to the minus, you know, this is even bigger than landscape numbers, okay? So, or smaller, I should say, okay? So, I just mentioned this as one, I, I, you know, one argument that, uh, you know, that some role for, you know, another argument for some role for supersymmetry, even in this nightmarish kind of landscape story. Uh, actually, a related question, which is really troubling, uh, which the landscape does raise, and I invite you to think about, uh, is the question of symmetries. So I, I still, when I sit down and write models, I say, well, I have a symmetry that makes this or that natural. But within the landscape, it's not clear that symmetries are particularly special. Okay, so for example, how in a flux landscape, how does a symmetry arise? A symmetry arises because I only turn on fluxes. A symmetry at low energy arises because I only turn on fluxes which respect the symmetry. If you look at typical symmetries and typical land state models, well, that means that you can only turn on two-thirds of the fluxes. So you may have lots and lots of states, but you have a lot less than if you turn them all on. So your e, this famous 10 to the 500 becomes 10 to the 150. Okay, the 10 to the 150 is a lot, but it's a lot less than 10 to the 500. So the role of symmetries is, is and, our, and our notion of naturalness are not of symmetries are, in this context, I think somewhat challenged, and I don't, I have some answers to that question, but I'm, you know, it may be that that's, that's just wrong. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to end up with one last remark, I think I'm probably only three minutes over or something, uh, that uh, in a framework like this, uh, okay, uh, well I won't say, we will see, we have seen, notions of naturals can hold, okay, uh, if there is a low, a low energy symmetry, we still might encounter a little hierarchy, okay? And just to end this, I want to mention this, this tuning of a factor of 100 that I talked about in inflation. So uh, I, for other reasons, have been playing with various kinds of models of slow roll inflation, rather old-fashioned ones, okay? But in those models, uh, and those models are supersymmetric, and in those models, the same fields which are responsible for inflation can play a role in supersymmetry breaking. Okay? However, what would you think of as naturalness would favors high scale for inflation okay, and low scale for <coughs> supersymmetry breaking, but the same parameters control both. Okay? So there can be a tension okay, between uh, the scale of supersymmetry breaking and the scale of inflation. And you can rather, eat, well, and, uh, well, unfortunately, you can get anything, depending on what further assumptions I make about the model. But it's certainly easy to, to understand how that 1 over 100 fine tuning uh, in, for inflation could translate into a factor of 1 over 100 tuning, or slightly worse, uh, for supersymmetry. So I just end this by saying that I at least have been forced to think about the fact that by, the, by these landscape ideas, that my thinking about la uh, naturalness may be a little too naive, and that I should be open uh, to the possibility that there is some strict notion of naturalness, but maybe, uh, there's a maybe there is a little bit of hierarchy, and maybe that's okay. okay? So I will, uh, I think that's all I have, and I will leave you with that. Okay? Thank you. I didn't offend David sufficiently. In that case, let's thank Mike yeah. for all this uh, set of lectures. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah.